caffeine, caffeine free herbal uh, because I don't need any more caffeine in my life. <laughs> I'm wrong. I'm walking caffeine. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's an herbal tea. And, sounds. Folks who know me think I need as much calmness as, as I can as I can grab a hold of. So. <laughs> sounds awesome. Uh, so I'm drinking a spiced chai tea with a little bit of lactate milk because I'm lactose intolerant. So cheers to we're, you. We're, where should you you're, you're t- drinking spicy? It's from you're from Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> where are you sitting today? Where are you Where are you right now? I'm at my home office. Um, my corporate office downtown is going is under construction because we're expanding. So during COVID, I uh, created a more robust home office. I could do media and work, and so I've, it, it sort of wraps around the corner, but it it allows me to operate without disturbing the family and without the family disturbing me. And actually there's a on air sign that I just flipped that literally blinks uh, mm-hmm. on air sign, on air mm-hmm. sign on both doors. Translation, stay. No, <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. Um, so I moved back home to Atlanta um, as we were speaking, you know, I, I grew up in Atlanta I went to law school in New York, um, but came back during the pandemic and am kind of like managing all of the, you know, wonderful family distractions that could happen working from home. But it's such a privilege to kind of have like that being that comfort zone. So amazing, amazing. Yeah, it's, so, it's beautiful. It was irritating. <laughs> well, cheers to you. And cheers, and cheers to you. My pleasure. All right. I almost grabbed my coffee. He was also sitting here. You drinking coffee too? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I love, I love coffee because uh, coffee gives me like palpitations. Yeah, no, no. Um, only unpaid bills gives me palpitations. <laughs> Welcome to Tea Time. I'm your host, Shamite Obialo, contributor for Black Enterprise, founder and CEO of the Sweets Business Community, where we help chief executives and entrepreneurs of color to scale their businesses by getting them access to the right connections, coaching, and capital resources. I'm an investor, entrepreneur, and corporate attorney, and for the last seven years have worked with U.S.-based businesses of all sizes to scale from seed stage to an IPO or even a private equity exit. Tea Time is our weekly conversational show where we invite investors, uh, thought leaders, executives to opine on recent business news and trends. And today I am so, so excited and privileged to welcome the one and only John Hope Bryant. John is an American entrepreneur, author, philanthropist, and prominent thought leader on financial inclusion, economic empowerment, and financial dignity. He wears many, many hats as founder, chairman, and CEO of Operation Hope, the largest nonprofit, best in class provider of financial literacy and economic empowerment services in the US, founder, chairman, and CEO of Bryant Group Ventures, and also founder and principal of the Promise Homes Company, which is the largest minority controlled owner of single family rental homes in the United States. He's named in Atlanta Business Chronicles the Power 100 Most Influential Atlantans in 2020, and also American Banker Magazine's 2016 Innovator of the Year. He's one of Time Magazine's 50 Leaders for the Future. Five former U.S. presidents have recognized his work, and he served as an advisor to not one, not two, but three sitting U.S. presidents from both political parties, and he's responsible for financial literacy becoming the policy of the United States federal government. He is a prolific public speaker and also an author of best-selling books, Up From Nothing, The Memo, How the Poor Can Save Capitalism, 
and love leadership. Whew. That was very impressive, a little intimidating. Welcome, Mr. Bryant, to Tea Time. Oh, my honor to be with you. And what a cool concept, both the Tea Time concept uh, and, of course, you're doing this with Black Enterprise, which I love um, and been reading my whole life. And hopefully when I get every uh, recipient of uh, one, million, one Million Black Business to also get a subscription to Black Enterprise. And I love your also your concept of uh, the suites uh, that you created your own business. So it's, it's, it's really cool. And I love anything that's African. So I've got African. I'm wearing Africa right now. I see that. You're representing. I don't have any real. I'm all I'm westernized today. Um, oh, you're, you're walking. It's OK. I'm walking. I, I zoomed it. <laughs> are it. So, yeah. what, what now? You are Africa. Your, your family's from Nigeria, so you don't, you don't have to do it. You're, you're Definitely. Not, you're not, you're not in that context, yeah. Definitely. I grew up here, but both my parents immigrated from Nigeria in the 80s. Um, so that is very true. So where you're, all, where you're all from, by the way. Exactly. The mother of, you know, for all of us. Um, so, John, you are the definition of a serial entrepreneur. Um, and these days, everyone is everyone and their mom seems to be getting into entrepreneurship. Um, but there's less visibility into exactly what it takes to really build and scale um, a successful business. Uh, you're someone who runs multiple businesses. Uh, in reading your bio, I mean, you you are a prolific public speaker, um, an author. You have several uh, businesses that you run. You're a policy advisor, you're a social media influencer, um, and you do all of these to a really, really high degree of excellence. Um, as I was reading and learning about Operation Hope, you have served more than 4 million individuals, um, directed just under 4 million in private capital to America's low billion. wealth communities. What now? 4 billion, not 4 million in capital. 4 billion in capital. Um, that's a huge, 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 huge investment. Um, so, so valuable. And I mean, the people want to know how you do it. Give us, please, some insights into a day in the life, um, how you manage your team, how you manage all these businesses and do it to such a high degree of success. Um, well, um, you know, first of all, I don't look at it that way. I just sort of get up every day and like a dog after a bone. <laughs> I mean, I'm very focused, uh, very persistent. I never give up the words can't and impossible don't exist in my dictionary. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm up early, early and stay up late and work harder than everybody else. I just outrun failure. And um, so it's, it's not some sort of really dramatic sort of, I don't, I want people to know that it's approachable. I want people to know that they can do it too, that I'm, I'm just a guy who is laser focused. When people decide to go party, I decided to go prepare. Uh, when folks decide to go protest, I decided to go partner. <laughs> when folks were in the streets, I was, folk, I was working the business suites. Um, it's not better or worse. It's just different. You know, um, there's a lot of things that, like, I never had a childhood, a normal childhood, because I started my first business when I was 10 years old. Um, there was, my, my childhood was a little rough because I grew up in Confident South Central and saw two murders before I was nine years old. But that aside, I, uh, when I started my business at 10, that allowed me to really focus on something that was positive and I could be passionate about and that I, a problem I could solve. I couldn't solve a lot of the problems around me, couldn't solve racism, couldn't solve bias, couldn't solve, solve inequality by myself at that time. So I focused on the problems I could actually solve and, um, and move the needle on that and, and got wrapped up in my own dream um, of success. And so in some ways I am giving myself a break starting to give myself a break now because I didn't really have a childhood growing, growing up. So I guess the, the, the biggest thing I'd say is that an entrepreneur works 18 hours a day to keep from getting a job. Now it sounds, you know, people hear that and they say, it sounds oppressive. No, not really. I don't think about it. I mean, I love what I do. I don't get tired. I get exhausted. So maybe I can't type another word on the keyboard and I need to get some rest. That's just about your battery sort of wearing down. And so uh, there's there's between gas and fuel, right? And gas is what you do because you have to. Fuel is what you get when you 
um, or living your best life. And what I do refuels me um, mm. or allows me to be refueled. And I, I don't get tired of it. Now, if you ever get tired of what you're doing, you should stop. You get tired of your mate. <laughs> you get tired of your friends. You get tired of your job. You get tired of your, whatever it is, you're tired of it. It should, it, it, you, you should not be able to say buy fast enough. Mm. Exhausted is a different thing. Exhausted, worn out, whipped. Okay, that's just about renewal. But, <laughs> but I don't get tired. So I guess the biggest thing is people think this is some kind of a burden. I'm excited every day. Mm. And the, uh, to me, sleep is, is, the, is the nap I take <laughs> between, <laughs> between action scenes, right? It's, it's, I mean, I, I go to bed late and I get up as early as I can and I hit it because I love being alive and I don't do drugs or alcohol because I love being sober. Mm. Uh, people, a lot of folks are like, oh, I, I do drugs or I do alcohol to relax. I'm already relaxed. Right? Mm. Uh, and I want to be present and sober in every moment that I'm in so I can optimize it. So that's not a direct answer to your question. But I guess what I'm really saying is it's a mindset. It's not so much about the mission, we're all on the same mission, which is freedom. I mean, what, mm -hmm. all money is, is optionality and freedom. That's all it is. It gives you optionality to choose what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it. Um, and, and success is a measure. The more success you have, the more freedom you have. There was a time where I had to show up with a suit and a tie. Um, uh, now, I couldn't show up with this Operation Hope jacket on. I couldn't wear, and I wear, you watch my videos, I wear themed t-shirts every day. I couldn't yep. wear a themed shirt. Right. Because... You know, I, because, you know, I didn't have the credibility. The freedom. Yeah, the freedom. Now, I, I do. People don't, you're like, oh, yeah, that's just the, that's just the message. You know, now the question is, what message shirt is John wearing today? Um, mm -hmm. In a business environment. So I don't, yeah. so folks cut me a break now that they wouldn't have before. But they're not looking at my, they're not looking at what I'm wearing. They're looking at, John, how many, yeah, and, and you know, that people know what this emperor station is. They want to know yeah. how. You know, my latest level of efficiency I've created. Mm -hmm. So it is, success is a measure of freedom. And today, freedom is made through self-determination. And you can't self-determine yourself unless you, you do it through economics. So today is social justice through an economic lens. Mm -hmm. So the harder I work, the more I hustle, the more success I get, the more freedom I have. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. So... Here, let me ask another question to do with leadership, to do with to do with business success, um, and it's something that has come up for me and really shocked me. And I haven't had an opportunity to ask someone who could really dig in and, and help me muscle through it. And it has to do with leading while black. Um, you know, the reality is that a lot of black leaders, um, whether they be uh, running a company or you know, working within an organization face difficulty leading a team that doesn't look like them mm -hmm. um, and may even feel more comfortable operating with um, a white figurehead. Um, and it's something that I didn't realize is more prevalent than you would think. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you've seen, you probably have seen the film, The Banker, yep. um, right, with Anthony Mackie and Samuel L. Jackson, where they essentially had to put in place um, you know, a white guy to be the front man for their business. Um, I wanted to talk to you about um, how you navigate being a leader in so many corporate circles where, of course, people don't look like you. Being a leader and leading a team that may or may not look like you um, and, and really kind of stepping into that without kind of compromising any of who you are. Um, so let's talk about a little bit on that. So no one's ever asked me the question before um, that I can recall. So good job. Um, and I do tons and tons of interviews. I did one this morning, one on Friday for Network TV. No one's ever asked me the question. Um, it's a really important question. And it speaks to what I said earlier about mindset. There are three types of mindsets. Uh, there's a surviving mindset, a thriving mindset, and a winning mindset. And winner, winners are builders. Uh, thrivers are basically the middle class and, and surviving is folks with too much month at the end of their money who may be depressed, who may, who may have been beaten down by the world. Um, they're experts in what they're against, not what they're for and what you see. And so whether you believe you can or whether you believe you can't, you're right. So if you, deceive, if you believe racism is real, you're going to see it, racism wherever you go. <laughs> 
it's become self uh, affirming. Like you buy a bicycle, you start seeing bicycles everywhere. You buy a Mercedes Benz, you start seeing Mercedes Benz everywhere. It's not that more Mercedes or bicycles showed up. It's just that that's what you're looking for now because you identify with it. So when you start identifying with your pain, guess what you start? Guess what you start looking? You, you, whatever you whatever you're looking for, you're gonna find it. And so in my book, Up From Nothing, this last one that um, of five books I wrote, my favorite. Um, I talk not about the, the shiny thing. I talk about basically rainbows after storms, how over the round and through it, I, I got to it. And it's five basic things that if you get these five things, no one will, will can keep you from greatness. If you get three of these things, you're at least successful. If you have less than three of these things, you're dead in the water. Um, as much education as you can shove down your throat, understanding how the economy works, wealth creation works, financial economy, economy basic financial literacy, family structure and resiliency. This is the question you're asking now. Self-esteem and confidence, those two things are different. Let me come back to that. And role models and environment. So role models and environment basically means, you know, you model what you see. If you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the 10th. Coming back to the thing that really is pivoting on your question and then the answer to it is people confuse self-esteem and confidence. So if you're competent, it, it promotes confidence. So now you're a good engineer, so you succeed at that. You're good at, at sports management or the arts or whatever, you're, you're a great dancer, then you exude confidence uh, and competent, and that comes from your competence and you can be successful. That doesn't mean you've got a high self-esteem. Mm -hmm. So if I don't like me, I'm not going to like you. If I don't feel good about me, I'm not going to feel good about you. If I don't respect me, don't expect me to respect you. If I don't love me, I don't have a clue how to love you. If I don't have a purpose in my life, then I'll make your life a living hell. Whatever goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. Jones told me, John, one ounce of my self-esteem depends on somebody else's acceptance of me. As my pastor, Reverend Murray, told me, it's not what people call you. It's what you answer to. That's important. Never, ever, ever answer out of your name. And then I added to argue with a fool proves there are two. So when I was coming up as an entrepreneur, I tried to sign a lease. I think I was 19 years old. I had a seven figure bank account mm -hmm. and I was starting a, a, another business. I was homeless two years before that, I think. So I'd worked my way back up three years before that I was homeless. And um, this company, I'll say it, the Irvine company in Southern California wouldn't mm -hmm. let me sign the lease. Mm -hmm. I had the balance sheet. I had the business. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian Coop companies back then, they wouldn't let me sign it. They wouldn't tell me why. They just were like, oh, and it was basically, and I was young. And I was young. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went and found a, a, a once successful six foot four Australian white guy who was losing his mansion in Pacific Palisades, no, Palos Verdes Peninsula, had once had a beautiful you know, convertible Aston Martin or something and didn't have a car when I met him. So he was on his way down filing bankruptcy. He, but he was smart. He looked the part. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, tell you what, I'll give you 10% of my company. <laughs> I'm going to make you president. I'm CEO. Um, but you're going to be my front man. And mm -hmm. the first thing I need you to do is go sign this lease. So he walked in 30 minutes later, the lease was signed. And um, it, it sort of the, the, the role Sort of went to his head, though. Uh, I gave him, I bought a Yugo, which is a really bad car, uh, as his company car. It cost me $3,000. And uh, it, when, when, I, when I tried to quit, when I, later on, we, we, we parted ways. I was like, where's my car? And he's like, oh, I, that, that's part of my compensation package. I sold that little raggedy car. So he, he, actually, he actually sold the car and pocketed the money and never told me because he, he was offended. I had him driving in a, in a Yugo. But... <laughs> Uh, he wasn't offended that I was black. He was offended I put him in a Yugo. I'll take that. So I, all my life, I've been an, a person of color running an organization that looked diverse below me. And in some cases, mostly white at the executive level, because I was having a hard time trying to find a black CFO or a black, you know, whatever the thing, the title. The, the, now I'm more diversity in my organization. In fact, I've got 70% women now in my, my companies. But there was a time early on where I was, having, I was having a challenge finding people who looked like me who had the, not the talent, but the experience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we all, this talent's off the, uh, off the chain, but do you have the pre-existing experience? I don't want you training on my balance sheet. Do, have you done this before, essentially? And of course, it's that Ferris wheel of you haven't done it before. Nobody gave you a shot. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I think that this comes down to self-esteem. Mm. That, that, so I'm coming back to this thing yeah. that, that when you're reasonably comfortable in yourself, everybody else will be comfortable with you. Now I've had a couple of folks, I won't name names. They will sue me, but I've had people who work for me at the very high level who resented, I believe that I was African American. They were white and they tried to take my company from me. One of my companies. So I just, I just sort of observed it. You know, like you, you, you got to be kidding me. I created this. This is my world. You're just living in it. And at the end of the day, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> at the end of the day, once they played their game to the end, when the music stopped, they didn't have a chair. I did. They're gone. I'm still here. Thank you for helping me get my company to the next level. So what I had to do is not be emotional, mm -hmm. not pop off of the mouth and give them some legal or other reason to say I'm either crazy or liable. Let make sure they don't walk me off the stage because I made an emotional decision. Whatever decision you make emotionally is going to be the wrong decision. You know, capitalism is a is a is a gladiator sport. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't take this stuff personal. Mm -hmm. Like you are out there hunting for your head. Not because you're black, <laughs> because mm -hmm. they want all the marbles. That's what they want. Mm -hmm. I mean, slavery was about bad capitalism. That wasn't about trying to. That wasn't some mission to hurt black people. They could care less about black people. They're trying to line their pockets mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. and become rich and wealthy on the backs of free labor, etc. Mm -hmm. And and diminishing us and diminishing our self esteem made us tools at scale for their enterprise without the, us pushing back. That's why they would hold the man down, abuse the wife in front of him until he stopped uh, fighting back because they're trying to break his spirit, not his body. Mm. They needed his body, but they didn't want him popping off. What we don't have, be, as a reaction to that, we have not healed, in my view, we've not healed as a group of people. So we tend to react versus respond. Mm -hmm. And we end up winning the battle and losing the war because we want to march, we want to throw a punch, we want to we want to show somebody how bad we are, shoot somebody on a street corner we don't own. <laughs> Talk about this mm -hmm. corner, you don't own nothing. It's true. The city owns that corner. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I just decided I, I, to argue with a fool. Proves there are two, as I said earlier. I decided I wasn't going to rearrange the deck chairs in the Titanic. Um, I decided I was going to win the war and not just the battle, which meant that somebody else had my, I might let somebody win the battle a couple of times, take a slight, take a swing at me here. They say they're talking mess to me, somebody else just follow it away. And, and then at the right time, I decided when they were out. So at the, at the end of the day, I'm chairman, founder and chief executive officer of my parent company and all of my subsidiaries. Mm -hmm. with the support of my partners, board members. So I didn't shove me down anybody's throat. Mm -hmm. uh, I hopefully inspired and, and showed through my leadership. Mm -hmm. You've got to show your leader not through how you manage your successes, anybody mm -hmm. can shop, mm -hmm. but how you manage your failures. Mm -hmm. uh, life is 10% what life does to you, and 90% how you choose to respond to it. So a, a lot of founders at the nonprofit level now, a lot of founders... Um, you'll see them as executive directors of the organization they founded. Somebody else, white man, will be chairman. <laughs> mm. Somebody else will be in charge of the money, essentially. Mm -hmm. and, and they're like, okay, you're the founder. Go sit. These are white folks, not just black people. White folks, go sit over there somewhere and, and inspire us. But don't believe the business to us. And I had to prove, as the organization grew, that I had what it took uh, to still be Chief mm -hmm. Executive Officer and Chairman of the Board. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I mean, you look at my board of directors. There's some big, big players on these mm -hmm. boards, and they, uh, and they, they defer to me. They're not being intimidated by me. Why would they be? Uh, they defer to me because they think that I'm better at doing this than somebody else would be. And I, and I take that, I take that role very lightly. I don't, I'm not a, I, I don't try to be ever obnoxious or pushy or whatever. When you got the power, you don't need to use it. You can afford to be gracious and kind. I've over answered your question, but it's a really <laughs> important question. Um, you, you've got to leave your ego at home. Mm -hmm. You've got to manage your insecurities outside of the business. Mm. You cannot afford to beat your chest and, and pop your, 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 your trousers suspenders. You can't, you can't be profiling on the job. You, you got to be not a black leader, but a great leader who happens to be black. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, and you inspire people to follow your lead because you're a better leader than even they acknowledge they are. But that's confidence versus self-esteem. Yes. Right? And, and you can have very low self-esteem and have high confidence, which is a great deal of our leaders in the world today have low self-esteem and high confidence. And when you have low self-esteem, you become arrogant, you become cocky, you, you, you're mouthing off. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you you're 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 quick to to uh, instigate. Mm-hmm. Got something to prove. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you're acting, you're acting like not a black person, but something else that has the black moniker. You you know the phrase I'm talking about, which is tied mm-hmm. to ignorance. Mm-hmm. And then people follow that away, and at some point they walk you off the stage. Mm-hmm. Wow, um, I love your answer, and I was I took some notes, um, but. I think in summary, it is not so much about, you know, the fact that, you know, you're a black leader or let's say, you know, you're a woman, Um, you know, it's really how to be a good leader, how to be smart in leadership and recognize there may always be someone who's trying to kind of take you down, uh, you know, take what, what, what you have and they would like. So you have to be smart. You have to be savvy there. Um, and really recognize the difference between confidence, which is a certain false sense of, of esteem and identity, um, and something that's more, um, more solid and a more solid foundation. And that is, you know, something that builds up over time, but certainly like checking out your book um, and, and a lot of your leadership tips, which you share um, on your social media um, is really critical to kind of building that leadership. But I, I really appreciate the distinction, the distinction you've made with being a great leader versus being a great African-American or black leader. Um, so it's really important that people become reasonably comfortable in their own skin. Yep. That's really what I was saying. Yeah. Very few people actually are reasonably comfortable in their own skin. No one's comfortable in their own skin. That's a lie. <laughs> I mm. mean, even Jesus, even Jesus had it at moments of insecurity when he's being crucified. Lord, why have you, oh Lord, Father, why have you forsaken me? That was God questioning, mm-hmm. that was Jesus questioning his father, God, yeah. why have you forsaken me? Because over a moment he was insecure. Mm. So all of us have insecurities, mm-hmm. but, but do you live, I mean, Faith is what you do when you don't have all the facts. Mm-hmm. Right? So if you are truly in yourself rooted, if you are if you are rooted in a core set of values and you're you know who you are, then at some point you do calm down. You you mm-hmm. do take a breath and, and breathe through it. And you don't change who you are based on circumstances around you. Mm-hmm. And a lot of so-called leaders, they they get their their nose get open, they pulled, they're pulled by the, the, the clubs and the, the bright lights and they start partying and they, they start, they, you start, you lose track of mm. what you're doing, right? Mm-hmm. There's a big difference between business and busyness. Mm. And mm. so when you're reasonably comfortable in your own skin, uh, you react to life. You don't re- respond to it. Sorry, uh, you, sorry, you respond to life. Sorry, you don't react to it. Um, mm. And uh, there's no more important blessing that I would hope for somebody mm. and that they become reasonably comfortable in their own skin. When you walk in the room and you're reasonably comfortable in your own skin, because, because we're not human beings having a spiritual experience, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. People can feel that. Mm. They can feel that. They can smell it. They can, they can almost touch it. It's textural. Mm-hmm. Then now you, now they connect with you at a deeper level, at a visceral level. And now they see you. Uh, and now they're comfortable. It's as if they've known you their whole life. And that is, to your next question, probably of when you walk in the rooms, you're the only black person there. You know, I decrease at some point. I've got to decrease me and increase others because they. My risk at that point is they feel that folks in the room feel insecure around me. Not mm-hmm. that I, not that I feel insecure around them. Mm-hmm. They feel insecure around me, and I can't afford for them to believe that I'm smarter than them. Mm-hmm. Phrase it. I can't afford for them to believe that I believe mm. that I'm smarter for them because I'm trying to get something out of them to help people I care about. Mm-hmm. So when you're reasonably comfortable in your own skin, you don't need to beat your chest. You don't need to profile. You don't need. There's no contest. If 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 somebody needs to if somebody needs to feel smart smarter better than me for an hour, knock yourself out. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's all good with me. Just I, I'm just trying to cut the deal. 
Mm-hmm. Right? Servant leadership, right? Yes. Leadership. Yeah. Amazing. All right. Very inspirational. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, your nonprofit, Operation Hope. You started it in 1992 in the wake of the Rodney King riots. And I mean, you know, you've grown it tremendously. Um, and, you know, it, we've talked about the way that you turn towards partnership over protesting, you said, um, and have moved from, you know, in the streets to the suites in terms of really building relationships in corporate America. Yeah. And, um, you know, I really wanted to kind of dig into um, what some of the advantages and perhaps disadvantages are of pursuing your business in a social enterprise nonprofit model um, because many folks talk about the limitations of nonprofit business. Um, we recently had a conversation with Catherine Finney, who founded Digital Undivided, which is a nonprofit that is supporting the empowerment of women of color uh, entrepreneurs. And she talked about, um, we had a fireside chat, and she talked about how nonprofit is not for her. And now she's running a venture fund a seed stage venture fund and venture studio investing in black entrepreneurs. And I see what you've built with Operation Hope um, as of course, rivaling many of the strongest black businesses. So I wanted to talk to you about that pathway, you know, where you've seen it really serve you, but also perhaps some of the drawbacks of pursuing that um, vehicle for um, doing your work. Yeah. So I disagree with the narrative that nonprofits uh, are a limitation. I think the people who are running a nonprofit might limit the nonprofit's mission. Um, so I do agree with the young lady's uh, statement that running a nonprofit is not for her. It's not for her. And she was very smart to realize that she had a different calling and that calling for her was very focused. Um, you know, not everybody can multitask, <laughs> right? Um, not everybody is built to multitask. God, the world needs experts. Like, I really need people who are, my CFO, I don't want him at the club on Friday night. I don't want my, my CFO, you know, uh, giving motivational speeches. I want my CFO to be boring. I want, I want, <laughs> I want my chief operating officer to be boring. I, so I, a company underneath me is really a collection of people who know more and more about less and less. It's experts, right? I'm the generalist, right? I'm the dreamer. I mean, Dr. King didn't go on the mall and say, I have a dream that GDP will grow by 2% a year. <laughs> that wouldn't have inspired anybody. So the vision, the leader, the visionary, the entrepreneur, you know, you are legitimately crazy by the world standards at, at that level. But you're, you're sitting at a point, a 30,000 foot level, where you're seeing the world from a different vantage point, a different uh, it's not better or worse. It's just somebody looking at the world from 2,000 feet has a very different view of the world than somebody looking at it from 30,000 feet. Now, the person at 2,000 feet can do things I can't do. They, they got tactical reach. They can pull a lever. They can, they can, they can move things. I can't move things at 30,000 foot directly. I got I to gotta t- touch people who are touching people. But I also can, can move a bigger thing at 30,000 feet than I can somebody at 2,000 feet. So if you're trying to get rich, if you're trying to make money for yourself, don't run a nonprofit. (laughs) Because if you're doing that, you're going to jail. (laughs) If if you're (laughs) you're trying to make money and you're trying to get rich uh, and you want power, don't become an elected official and black. Because you do that, you're going to jail. Um, And so you got to, if your tactical view of the world is narrowly focused like that, and you don't have patience to wait, let the game come to you. Uh, I've not been on a three-year uh, trek. I've been on a 30-year trek because it takes 20 years to change your culture. You can't even change a culture in less than 20 years. Uh, and so my vision and mission of myself was large. I said at an early age in my teens that I'm put here to be a relay racer, to introduce Black America and then by extension all of America into social justice, essentially through an economic lens. Economic empowerment is the next level for civil rights to civil rights. I've been saying this, you know, all of my life, that the next mission was economics. And even when I said that back then, people literally rolled their eyes uh, at me and said, this guy, financial literacy, what is he talking about? Because all the rage was politics. All the rage was 
sports or entertainment or whatever. Now, as you say, business and entrepreneurship is sexy. But it wasn't sexy back back then. So I had to be comfortable being someplace where nobody was, being focused on something that nobody was focused on. But I wanted to change the world as we knew it, eradicate poverty as we knew it, mental poverty in my lifetime. Um, And that's a different. So in that regard, then a nonprofit platform, uh, a a blank canvas, (laughs) no limitations. So I'm going to flip the script now. If you don't want to be an elected official, right? Uh, I'm, I don't want to be president of the United States. I'm not going to run. So what am I doing with my gifts? Give mm-hmm. me a blank slate. Give me a nonprofit, 501c3. Let me turn it into one of today, one of the, and my goal is the, but one of the most important, most relevant non-governmental civil society organizations in the entire country, which is the largest economy in the world, which makes it the sole superpower in the world. So if, if, if we can achieve that, if I can achieve that in the next five years, making it one of the most relevant, right now we're in 30 states with physical offices. I'm going to make it America's financial coach. I'm going to make it uh, uh, the Starbucks of financial inclusion, the private banker to the poor, the working class, the shortly middle class, um, the conscious on capitalism, uh, uh, a creator of an economic system for Black America and a laddering system for those making $60,000 a year or less into their future aspirations. I mean, and we, and at that point, have influence on government, community, and the private sector as a partner at scale. Then, then the question then is, could I have done it with anything other than a nonprofit? <laughs> the answer to me is no. I couldn't have done it as mayor, couldn't have done it as a city council person, couldn't have done it as a governor. Uh, uh, I don't, I mean, they could have done it, maybe they could have done it as an ex president. In that case, Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton, a friend of mine, is a model for that. With what he once created was Clinton Global Initiatives. Unfortunately, he stopped that when his wife ran for president. But he was on the verge of becoming the most, I mean, for a moment, he was the most powerful citizen in the world, non-elected. It, and so, so I would argue, it just depends what your calling is, what your mission is, what you're going after. If you're trying to get something about me versus we, don't do a nonprofit and don't run for office. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to get into trouble. Um, now, has my, as me being, I've got audited financials, clean as a whistle. We're one of the top, I think I was told the top 7% of all nonprofits in the country based on rankings by Charity Navigator. Not black nonprofits, not community-based nonprofits. No, no, no. United Way, you know, Red Cross, I mean, Red, American Red Cross, Operation Hope. Right there, the top 89% of every dollar goes to our mission, transparency on financials, all that stuff, while still growing I mean, we grew 100% in the last six months. I, my budget grew from 25 million, almost 50 million in six months, just as a nonprofit. Um, but, but my salary didn't change. Not my, my hand's not in the cookie jar. I'm not, my, you, you won't see any funny business with anything having to do the same organization. Uh, to me, it's just more resources. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. now, did that brand, did, did me doing well for 30 years? help me in business? Of course it did. But that can't be my aim. Mm-hmm. In fact, my mission, I got two prom- I got two commitments from my, to, my, to my team at, at, at my office of the chairman who runs all my, my entities. I don't ever want you to do anything uh, that you don't want to see on the front page of the New York Times in five years. Don't put me in a limousine at Operation Hope by accident. Don't put me in a five-star rest- a five-star hotel and charge the operation hope. Don't put me in a first class seat, I'll upgrade, right? So I can give, the second rule is I can give to operation hope, operation hope cannot give. So my for-profit can benefit my non-profit, my non-profit cannot benefit my for-profit. So there's some rules mm-hmm. of engagement that you've got to have if you're going to build social uh, equity. Mm-hmm. Um, and you got to be, you, they got to be non-negotiable. Mm-hmm. Now, I've also built $125 million worth of real estate over here <laughs> in the last four years alone in my spare time, the Promise Homes Company. But there's separate staffing, separate mm-hmm. office, separate se- separate physical address. You know, uh, you got to be paranoid. When you're, when you're born black, you're mm-hmm. born on probation in America. Mm-hmm. <laughs> twice as smart, twice as intelligent, twice as well-dressed, twice as honest, get up twice as early, sit twice as late, be twice as paranoid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I got you. Wow. And I think, you know, just briefly touched on 
the for-profit business that you're doing, but right before we started this talk, you said that before building social enterprise uh, empire, you've got to build your empire. Yeah. So I was more, um, I was more, I was more blunt than that. You're being more gracious. <laughs> I, I said, that's, I my said corporate, that's my corporate finesse. <laughs> You can't um, build social. You can't build social equity until you got real equity. Or to, or to, or to quote another way, Shimon Paris told me, "God rest his, God rest his soul." John, people are going to criticize you in your work. When they criticize you, you tell them this: even if you want to spend money like a socialist, distribute money like a socialist, you have to first collect it like a capitalist. Mm -hmm. So I, so I build wealth over here. Mm -hmm. And I give and I invest it over here. Mm -hmm. I, I build up power over here so I can give it away over here. Mm -hmm. So power, my whole purpose of power is to give it away. Yep. But you gotta collect it. Yeah. I got you. Well, listen, um, I really want to talk about something that's really exciting that you're working on. That is actually how a lot of folks in the black community are going to build that wealth over here. Um, your 1 million black business initiative that you're doing in partnership with Shopify. Um, in the middle of the pandemic, you negotiated this massive opportunity for black owned businesses to thrive. And yep. I want you to tell us about it and specifically how can folks get involved in this? How can we both partner with you uh, to support the initiative? Um, and also to be the beneficiaries if we're running businesses and, and want some of that, you know, some of that, some of those resources. Yeah. So this is, a, this, this in some ways brings everything together of all the topics we've been talking about, including leadership skills, because people ask me all the time, how did you negotiate $250 million worth of commitments from Zoom in the middle of a pandemic in 2020? And it's, you set it up and it pays itself off. I've been saying all this stuff for, you know, 28 years. And, you know, when I get in the room with the founder of Shopify, who I think is worth $9 billion today, Toby is a friend of mine. Um, and he says, well, John, you know, we've had a great town hall meeting. What can we do to help? It can't be, well, hook me up. The answer can't be, write me a check. The answer can't be, invest in my business. The answer can't be line my pocket. The answer can't be you owe black people, a, you know, a, whatever. If you're coming from the wrong headspace, you're going to mess up that moment. So the also answer also can't be, well, can you help three businesses? This guy is a billionaire. He's built the largest e-commerce company and a largest company in Canada. He's used to thinking big. But he asked me a question and the answer was important. And I said, well, Toby, I don't know. Uh, help me create a million black businesses in America. <laughs> And he, and he was like, wow, that's fascinating. Now, he can relate to that. He built businesses. And he says, well, you mean like a social enterprise? I said, no, 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 no. Like the black Shopify. Like you built yeah. Shopify. Just give me the black version of it, right? And he's like, I like that. Can you send me something on it? Sure. Hung up the phone. Wrote something up, like a 10-page uh, PowerPoint. Sent it to him. Uh, crickets. Heard nothing. I didn't protest his office or call him an SOB or just call it racism. The guy's busy. I figured, okay, you don't like the idea? Next item. I mean, he don't owe me nothing. And about a week later, I'm sorry, 10 days later, exactly, 10 days later, he sent me an email. Hey, John, I got to find this email, actually, and get it framed. Uh, this went to my spam folder. I'm so sorry. Of course I'll do. Mm. And that conversation turned into a $20 million commitment from, to a $25 million commitment to a $35 million commitment. And then three days before we announced it, they said, how about $130 million? Mm. <laughs> and, and, and so it's free licenses for everybody who, uh, if you black or you think you black, <laughs> uh, if you think you black, that qualifies, uh, and you want to start a business or expand your brick and mortar business to include e-commerce, we're going to hook you up with a $25,000 package for licenses, tools, and services, and websites, and everything else, and professional device from wonderful people like this young lady for free. All you do is invest your time and your talent. So one MBB, one million black business initiative is the third part of the third reconstruction between now and 2030 mm -hmm. to create financial literacy for all, black wealth, corporate inclusion, getting blacks on board, boards of directors, and national financial coaching network, which I've already mentioned, mentioned is what I'm building with Operation Hope, 
So 1MBB is the centerpiece to creating black wealth, which uh, is the centerpiece for everything else we want to do in our lives. 96% of our businesses don't have an employee. We don't have time for this conversation, but it is depressing. Um, so you can't create wealth unless you're, you create wealth in your, in your sleep, compounding. You need employees, you need technology, you need infrastructure. So we're helping you create all of that while you focus on selling. You focus on, on delivering your, your service. You, you focus on whatever you're good at. We're going to wrap around a website, wrap around domain name, wrap around e-commerce, wrap around fulfillment system, wrap around delivery system, wrap around uh, consulting for advice and, and, and accounting, and business management, law, a law for free, by the way. You make your first sale. We're going to give you a credit line for free. Shopify is. Mm. So there's no excuse. There's no excuse for us any, not getting into this. Any world. stage of business, like in terms of breathing, you know, revenue size or any breathing, breathing you're business. business. <laughs> you're breathing business. Amazing. Okay. Well, yeah. I'm definitely going to share it with the Swedes community. We're going to share it with the Black Enterprise community, um, many other uh, networks that I'm a part of. Um, and, you know, just super, super thrilled that you had the um, fortitude, the self-esteem to just put that offer on the table and, and not back away from it just because you didn't get a response immediately, which is what a lot of folks, you know, tend to do is start to second guess themselves, mm -hmm. um, myself included. So uh, this is great. You know, congratulations. By, by the way, you know, you know what I would have done if he had not responded to that email? What? emailed somebody else yeah. because I, at that point I knew it was a good idea. Right. And it, my view is there's 8 billion people on the planet. Somebody's not talking to you. Just go talk to somebody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? somebody tell you, yes. I love it. Well, John, this has been, you know, really enlightening. I feel like I got a little free mentorship session. Um, so I appreciate your time. Um, I'm planning to be at the conference um, in Atlanta. So hopefully we can meet there and, you know, continue to support what you're doing with Operation Hope with the 1 Million Black Business Initiative. You guys, we have been uh, joined by Mr. John Hope Bryant. I'm Shamite Oviallo. This is Tea Time and I'll see you guys next time.